Hello, everyone. I'm Randy Kretz. I'm the CEO of U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. And on behalf of your host, the Texas Farm Bureau, I'd like to welcome you all here in the audience here in Austin uh, to our Food Dialogues Austin event on the University of Texas campus. We're so pleased to be here. Um, the, uh, this is a live streamed event, so not only do we have those of you here in the audience, but we have also have people streaming to this uh, and watching it all across the country on their smartphones and, and in their offices and, and uh, everywhere else. So we're very pleased to have those of you that are watching it from afar as well. Um, we'd like to, to encourage discussion today around our key issues that we're going to be talking about, and that's animal welfare uh, beyond the hype and farming methods, consumer interpretation. So it's a, it's a, a good event today. We have a couple of hour and a half sessions planned and we're very excited about the topics and the panelists that we have and we're eager to get the conversation started. For those of you that want to ask questions that are not here in the audience, please feel free to, uh, to do that through our social spaces. Uh, and the hashtag is food D. So hashtag F O O D D. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And I'm sure after the event, the panelists will want to engage in those questions as well in social spaces. Let me, uh, let me introduce our moderator today. We're very pleased to have Evan Smith. Evan's the co-founder of the Texas Tribune and is currently the CEO and editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune. He's a former editor-in-chief of Texas Monthly. Before co-founding the Tribune, Evan spent nearly 18 years at Texas Monthly, including eight years as editor and a year as president in chief. On his watch, Texas Monthly won the National Magazine Award for General Excellence. Evan also hosts a nationally syndicated interview series on PBS, Overheard with Evan Smith. Evan, thank you very much for being here today, and I turn it over to you. Pleased to do it. Thank you so much, and glad to be here. Thank you, everybody in the room. Thank you, everybody on live stream. Uh, uh, so happy to have the opportunity to lead a really wonderful, robust, uh, interesting conversation on the subject of uh, animal welfare uh, and related topics. I think we're going to touch on a few things outside of just the literal topic of animal welfare, but all related. And we have six uh, wonderful experts on uh, various aspects of the subject who are up here with me, and I'm going to introduce them before we begin. And I'm going to go from uh, left to right. Uh, on my immediate left is Chad Lemke. Chad is a fifth-generation farmer and rancher in Central Texas. He hails from uh, Mason, Correct. Uh, old yellow country, if you know something about Central Texas. At McCollum Lemke Ranches, they look for better ways to raise animals and improve the land without the use of traditional chemicals and fertilizers through the use of mob grazing, bio biologicals, cover crops, and many other alternative methods. He's also the production manager for the Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance. On his uh, left is uh, Ms. Adele Douglas, who gets the award for traveling the farthest to be here today. <laughs> she came to us all the way from Virginia, where she serves as the CEO of the Humane, of, of Humane Farm Animal Care. She initiated the concept of humane certification for farm animal products in the U.S., beginning with her launch of the Free Farm Program for the Farm Animal Services. She served as an invited participant on numerous industry animal welfare committees and serves on the board of the Center for Food Safety. On her left is Mr. Donald Brown. He and his wife Kelly are the fifth generation to own and manage the R.A. Brown Ranch in the Texas town of Throckmorton. It's been a family business since 1895. So great to hear about people who've been at this for so long, and we'll talk a bit about that. The Browns use technology such as artificial insemination, embryo transfer, ultrasounds, and DNA testing to produce superior genetics that fit the needs of the beef business. On his left is the memorably named Betsy Ross, who in partnership, I'm sure that's not the first time she's heard that, in partnership with her brother manages the 530-acre Ross Farm cattle uh, operation in the town of Granger in Williamson County. Together they raise and market all natural grass-fed beef under the Betsy Ross grass-fed beef label. I'd buy that most definitely just on the basis of the name. No grains, GMO crops, or forages, commercial or chemical fertilization used on the farm or given to their cattle. She's also the CEO of Sustainable Growth Texas, a consultancy and biological services company. Every good panel has to have a smart academic, and so to the left of Ms. Ross, we have Dr. Ron Gill, who is the Associate Department Head, Program Leader, and Extension Livestock Specialist at Texas A&M University in College Station. In addition to his interest in beef cattle nutrition and grazing management, Dr. Gill provides leadership and extension programming related to animal well-being, stockmanship, and low-stress 
livestock handling. And then finally, long list of people on our panel is Jason Peeler on the farthest end. For more than a century, Mr. Peeler's family has grazed cattle on South Texas grasslands. They're from Floresville. His opinions on animal welfare come from years of experience and thousands of head of cattle. All cattle handling employees who work for the Peelers are beef quality assurance trained. The feed yard and ranch are beef quality assurance certified. Please join me in welcoming our great panelists. <laughs> Now, we have on the panel, as I indicated, a couple people who've been at this and whose families have been at this for a long time. I think it would be helpful before we begin what's going to be a really long and substantive discussion on the issues before us to have a little bit of a sense more about you all and how you find yourselves in this business. I mentioned, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Brown, that you and your wife are the fifth generation uh, to manage this, uh, this ranch in Throckmorton, going back, again, before 1900. Has there ever been a point in the interim where people in your family or where you all thought, you know what, I just need to go off and do something else? There's a time, time to get out of this business. Or this stuff's in your blood. I would say it's a combination of the two. Yeah. And, you know, it's, we've gone through five generations in our family, and uh, there are times where you want to holler calf rope, as we say in agricultural terms, and that's enough yeah. uh, of a challenging industry and um, and. and managing so many things that are outside of our control as we work in and with creation yeah. uh, that uh, you know we're at mother nature's disposal if you will at there's times. a certain amount you can control and a certain amount you can't exactly right exactly. mr lempe you're also it's fifth generation right correct S same question to you you recognize the limitations of what you can control mm -hmm. but obviously it's something that you've chosen to stay with and and propel forward from absolutely. previous generations absolutely it's a way of life i think the brown family uh, speaks to that they're a testament they've, they've been around about as long as we have uh, and people that grow up in agriculture that have ranch and farmland in their family it is part of who they are it's part of where they came from it's part of their heritage and for those of us to continue to uh, work in that field given the obstacles both weather legislative and economic uh, shows just the resilience of farming and ranching families. Mr. Peeler, compared to these two, you're a relative rookie at this, only just more than a century, right? <laughs> uh, uh, at, at, any, at any point, uh, uh, have you or people in your family thought, you know, the obstacles to continuing this at the level and at the quality we want may be too great? In my life, yes. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure, it, and I'm also fifth generation. <clears throat> okay, there you yeah. go. Well, then you're aligned with these guys. They came in the right. 1890s. And, right. And, um, I think they went broke a few times. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say, when, about the time I got out of school, which would have been in the 80s, in high school, and, and uh, um, beef wasn't, um, it wasn't necessarily perceived as, as a good occupation or a good thing. We were, we were losing customers, um, yep. losing ground to chicken, losing ground to other things, and it just and prices weren't that good. It was, it was really bad. It was really dry in the late 80s, and, uh, and I was told to be a doctor, be a lawyer, you know, go to school. And I, and I, so I went to A&M, and um, while I was there, I took a reinterest in agriculture. I grew up on a ranch and, I, and my intention was to leave. Right. And uh, anyway, got out of school and, and got back in it. And, and since then, you know, there have been sleepless nights, no doubt. Right. Um, but, but I never thought about getting out. Yeah. And uh, got a few kids interested, so I hope, so, hope we'll we can go to a sixth generation right. possibly. Hopefully. Right. Yeah. Dr. Gill, it must make you happy to know that A&M <laughs> still has that effect on people. They come to A&M and they get reinterested or they get interested. In any case, they come in one side. <laughs> They go out the other side and they end up back in that business. Good thing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a rewarding uh, career as well. But you know, I'm also I'm just a fourth generation, but we had a longer generation interval. In our yeah. group. We actually started in 1880 in Stanford, Texas. Uh, grandfather immigrant, great great grandfather immigrated from Ireland. Yeah. And started ranching in West Texas, so uh, we have gone in and out of it as yeah. well in the ranching side of it. And that's why I'm in academics. We didn't have that ranch property to go back to, and so I took a different path to stay involved in agriculture. Well, you're doing your part. And I'm trying to do my part. That's it. Ms. Ross, working with your brother, I bet that's got to be really interesting, and sometimes it may be a little difficult probably to to work that out, huh? Well, we, do, we get along pretty well. Yeah. Uh, and I ran away from the ranch when I graduated from, high, uh, from college and just returned in 1992. So I always wanted to come back, but I couldn't wait to leave because I remembered breaking troughs when the water troughs were iced and you right. had to go out and, you know, it, was, um, it wasn't as easy as it is now. 
in a way, to move around and stay warm. So <laughs> I went back in 92, but I'm kind of wondering, um, my family homesteaded in 1890, and I'm just to the third generation, and I'm wondering how y'all did that. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, what well, overachievers. What I can tell you is I went, I went into journalism not to do math, so yes, I, yes, I, I yes, can't okay. actually right. make this work. Right. I'll, I'll stop it. Now, ma'am, here we have on this stage, uh, you know, five people who are in one form or another lifers. You know, you come at this from another side. You come at this from kind of the policy end. Uh, you understand the politics of this. You understand your piece of this. Uh, but you're a lifer probably in your own way and that you've been thinking about and talking about these issues for a long time. Well, um, policy I can do in my sleep. And when I first got involved and I saw the way farm animals were being raised in food production, <clears throat> I thought something has to change. And I realized that policy legislation was yeah. not the answer. Um, having worked in Congress and having, having lobbied Congress, um, I felt very strongly that this was a market approach. And let me tell you, um, as I said, I can do public policy in my sleep, having to learn how to operate a nonprofit, how to create a certification right. system. This was all um, very challenging. But I'm also interested in what you say about you know <laughs> lobbying Congress and all that sort of stuff is one thing. But at the end of the day, this is kind of a retail business. You kind of have to go well, around and talk to people who are in the industry and really persuade them well, of the. Well, first of all, it was to find out what yeah. the issues were. Why were things the way they were? And there, it, because as in all things, everything's the shades of gray. Right. You know, and what were the problems? What were the issues, and how to solve them? Yeah. And um, and where you stand on these issues is often where you sit. Right. That's a very pers it's a very personal deal. Yeah. I want to ask about to to begin this conversation about animal welfare and to get everybody's take on this. Uh, many people in the room probably know. People up on the stage know that there was a a big national story yesterday involving uh, the mistreatment of dairy cows in New Mexico. Uh, I think we all probably agree that what was put out as video and as stories in the press, not representative of practices that anybody up here or anybody out here would condone, but it, it kind of highlights the, the, the issues of animal welfare. Can you all, I, I, I took some notes from the report on this. This is a case of workers kicking and punching cows, stabbing them with screwdrivers, um, cows being whipped in their faces and bodies with chains and metal wires, workers shocking sick and injured cows and dragging them with tractors, sick and injured cows with open wounds, infections, and injuries. This is an outlier case, Mr. Brown, right? This is not representative of the way this is done or should be done. You're exactly right, yeah. and a disappointment to uh, the 99 percent of us in our business or more because we do care for the animals in which we take great responsibility in caring for, yeah. and it's very disappointing to see these isolated cases. Yeah. Mr. Peeler, people are tarred with, with the same brush often in cases like this, right? People judge an industry or judge practitioners in an industry by the outliers, and this may be a case no, of an it's, outlier. Uh, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Talk, talk about it. It really that. is. Uh, I mean, we, we work really hard to take care of the animals, and we know people are interested in how we take care of them. Yeah. And, and we do a lot of employee training. We do our own personal training and, um, it, and spend a lot of time and effort and sometimes a lot of money to try and make sure that our animals are taken care of. And, and we want people to know that. We want consumers to know that. We want chefs to know that. We want grocery store chains to know that. Yeah. Uh, we've got good groups telling our message. Um, and when something like this comes out, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit scary, and it, it's not good to see, so, and it's sensational, so it's all over the place. Yeah. And you know, yesterday morning early, I'm getting it from every organization. I mean, it's just people saying, I can, can watch this video. It's horrible. And it is. It's really yeah. not good. It's disturbing. And it does have a ripple effect to the industry, and we just have to keep uh, plucking the bad apples off the tree. Right. Mr. Mr. Lemke, the fact is that the press is probably as much responsible for the distribution of this stuff because, the, you know, the press, that's them, not me. <laughs> the, pr the press, the press does like the occasional sensational story. It, Absolutely, it, it Absolutely. gets ratings. It sells newspapers. What, what have you? But the fact is, what we see in this video is pretty horrible. It's horrible, but it is a, it is rare. It is not indicative of the industry as a whole. You're going yeah. to have that, I think, in any industry. Uh, they don't show the stories about the probably Jason said 99 percent plus uh, operators out there that are doing things right day in and day out. Yeah. Ma'am, is that your perspective, that this is a rare, a rare instance that uh, we should just regard as such an, uh, an aberration, or do you have the sense that maybe this is a little bit more pervasive than we're aware of? I think this is extreme, but I don't think that it's, I think that this particular case of what we saw was extreme, but I don't think that 99% of the industry 
uh, the dairy industry or handling is um, perfect. Uh, I think you have a great group here and most ranchers and farmers right. try to do the right thing and do the right thing, but I would not say that that's maybe one um, of, of uh, all of the operations in the U.S. Yeah, it's something we should pay attention to regardless. I think that's yeah. right. Ms. Ross, thought, thoughts about that? Well, I think very unfortunate, it's embarrassing, it's horrible, it's unconscionable, it's yeah. just not right. You know, we can say that all day long, but sometimes when things like this are brought to um, everybody's attention, it helps us all rethink. Yes. Right. right. It's a teachable moment, and, right? And Correct. What, how we need to, you know, put a, uh, how careful we need to be. And um, the number one question I get when people call me about my grass-fed beef is, how do you treat your animals? Right. And, uh, is it different than it used to be? Do you get those questions more now or in a different way now than you might have, say, 5 or 10 or 20 years ago? No, uh, I get them less now as there are more people and people are used to uh, uh, have, uh, there are more small herds that people read about yep. and, and people out among the cattle. Whereas with the big ranches, you know, the cattle, you see them and they might scoot on off. Whereas right. someone like me on 500 acres is walking among the cattle, they don't yep. run off, we look at them differently. And my job is to help them express their, their full potential because okay. they are God's creatures. Yeah. And I'm one too, so I've got a responsibility. And I think that's the way most of us feel. I like the way you, you put that, that's good. Uh, Do Dr. Gill, do you find in the uh, course of the work you do at A&M that there's much discussion of uh, you know, people who may eventually like Mr. Peeler? get interested in this business, uh, that, that these issues are coming up more and more as part of the discussions in class or in curriculum or on campus? Uh, they, they certainly are coming up more and more often and we spend more and more time trying to train students um, in how to more effectively handle livestock. I think that's a huge component of that video. There's a lot of that probably stems from frustration or a lack of training. Right. Or a lack of love for animals. And if you can identify those people, they need to be out of an operation. Right. One or the other or the other, you take them, you, take them out of the you have to. You have right. to either retrain them or get rid of them. Uh, Mr. Lemke, let's assume what the panel says. This is an aberration pretty much, right? Uh, surely there are more commonplace issues with regard to treatment of animals. Again, not looking at the extreme is something that we see often enough. But sort of on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month basis, there are probably issues within the business that are related to the treatment. Yeah, practice. absolutely. Talk about what some of those might be. Uh, well, once we take out the extreme, which I agree, with yeah. Adele, there, there are lots of shades of gray after that. And you have from what we would consider low animal welfare, which this would be the extreme on that end, right. to ultra animal welfare. And you have ranges all in between. You have small ranches and big ranches that function all within those shades of gray. So I think what Adele's organization tries to do and several other organizations out there is quantify where a producer lies in that scale and show the consumer who is extremely, they're hyper interested. Yeah. They're very, very intelligent. Much more now. so than they ever before, right? They want to know the story. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Uh, Betsy's been doing it a long time. I, I love Betsy. I call her the grandmother of grass fed. She was doing grass fed before it was cool. Before it was above. cool, right. The rest of us just kind of came in on her shirt tails and we were able to capture some of that knowledge which she is more willing to share. But those are the questions we get. How are the animals treated? What are they eating? Uh, do you have a relationship with your animals or a relationship with the land? But you can have that with big operations as well oh, as yeah. small. Can I? Yeah. I? Ma'am. I would like to say our organization we have a 37-member scientific committee who wrote the standards, and they're based on the needs of the animals, whether they're in a big operation or a small operation, and that's the key. What are the physiological and behavioral needs of the animal? When I started this, the animal welfare, the, the answer to what is good animal welfare is, are they breathing and are they reproducing? <laughs> right. And you all only know the that most that's basic, true. Only the most that's basic right. stuff. And right. you know that's true, and that was it. There was no, nothing about their behavioral needs or other than if they're still breathing and they're reproducing, there's nothing to question. So your, your, your point is that the standards for what qualifies as humane treatment may actually differ from big to small or it's essentially no, it's a consistent set of standards? It's, a, it's consistent because right. it's what the animal needs and right. depending on the type of system, how the system has to adjust to meet the needs of the animal. What is the humane uh, certification program that you're... Uh, is you, certified humane? You initiated it. Certified, right, certified Explain what, 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 what uh, 
thresholds do you have to cross to get that certification? Well, um, give me a little more specific. Are you talking about beef standards? Yeah, if you sure. want to talk about beef standards. Well, you can have, we have grass-fed beef on our program. We have beef uh, that is finished on feedlots. We yep. have very strong feedlot standards of, for example, sloping, um, shade, uh, windbreaks for weather, uh, space requirements, how much space there has to be, right. um, and those kind of things. And nobody else has feedlot standards. I don't know that any other um, certification does. Do you get any pushback on, on that certification <clears throat> standard? Oh, of course we do. Yeah. yeah, there are people who are, you know, it's all or nothing. Well, again, what's the need of the animal if most of the animals in the U.S. beef are finished on feedlots? How do you ignore that? Right. So we have very strong feedlot standards. Um, uh, transport, slaughter, we use the AMI standards, and some of the recommendations in the AMI guidelines, which are recommendations, are yep. we use as standards for slaughter. And, um, and it's feed. There's no hormones, no antibiotics, um, yeah. because if you're raising them right, you all know that's not necessary. Um, I mean, if the animal is sick, they, they have to be treated, and they can still be on the program, because it's not humane to leave an animal not treated. Um, and so those are just um, no animal byproducts in the feed, period. Right. Um, those are uh, just a couple of some things. Of, like some it. of the parts that go into yeah. the surrogate. Um, Ms. Ross and Dr. Gill, you know, you, you maybe have been at this the longest of the people in the group. Personally, been at the, the, these issues the longest. Talking to you, Ms. I'm talking to both. <laughs> I'm saying that respectfully. I want to actually, I want to tap into your the wisdom of your years here and say, you know, I, Ms. Douglas alluded to the idea that maybe the definition of humane might have evolved over time. That you know, at, at a certain point, it might have been much more basic, and now maybe we think about the concept of uh, of humane treatment differently. Ms. Ross, in your mind, how has that evolved? How has it changed? Well, I think the definitions have in, evolved, but really, when you hoorah an animal or run them, you're losing weight, and the uh, markets are all based upon weight. Right. So, who you know, you, you, we if we got when we were growing up, if our horses started getting away from us uh, accidentally, and we were running the herd down the hill, you know, so the wind would come through our hair great fun, we would get in trouble because right. we'd probably just dropped a bunch of weight when they were going to be shipped the next day. So um, we, I have never been around abuse of animals uh, in my uh, growing up on the ranch and, and d what I'm doing. And yeah. um, I, I don't, th I think the definitions have changed, but I don't think the uh, I don't think the standards have really. Dr. Gill, from your perspective, has, has the concept of humane treatment changed? The concept of humane treatment has not. Yeah. Humane treatment's always been humane treatment. Right. We try to massage it a little bit and change it to fit somebody's particular need or desire to make an expression about something, but the basic uh, husbandry of livestock, humane handling of core, livestock core principles is, has never changed, and right. I think we've we had a tendency, in the, even in academia, academia, to not focus on husbandry as yep. much as we should have. Right. In fact, we changed the name of all the departments from husbandry to science. science right. And we assumed the people coming into those programs understood husbandry, so we were going to take it to the next level in the right. science. Uh, we have to back that up now because the people coming into our department, 85 to 90 percent of them do not have an animal background but they're coming into animal science, so we have to do a better job of training students to come out, to go into the farms and ranches that really understand yep. animal behavior right. and the proper... They, they don't have the benefit, as Ms. Ross does, of having grown up around the stuff, right. and so they, they understand it naturally. Uh, Mr. Peeler, Mr. Uh, Brown, uh, let me ask you about, uh, more generally, what worries you as working ranchers? What, what are the things that keep you up at night? What are the anxieties you have? Um, whether it's well, related to the handling of livestock or you know, the economics of this, what, what are the, the video is disturbing. I mean, it, right. I mean, because that can wreck you. And, and, and I spend a lot of time with, with my kids, with employees and, right. and, and, and have zero tolerance for behavior like that. And, yeah. uh, you know, you get one guy in there, you're not paying attention to I mean, that, that can absolutely wreck you and your reputation. And that, that, that keeps me up at night. Um, if I, if I could veer just a little, sure. I, I mean, this is my opinion. I, I think your 99% unfortunately is too high. I think there's, in, in the gray area, maybe Chad was being nice or a deal. I mean, there, there is, we have plenty of room for improvement. I think right. there's a lot of people that really know what they're doing and do a good job. 
I see a lot of cattle coming and going. We, we buy a lot, just as a feed yard, we buy a lot every year from a, a lot of small, a lot of small guys who are just part-timers. Um, they're not, they're not bad. They're not like that video. There is no malice intended, but I think when you really know how to handle cattle, you know, and you know, you know, you don't need to be hollering at them. You know, you need yeah. to put yourself in the right spot in order to move them. I mean, there's a lot of things, you know, you see other people doing the wrong thing and, uh, you know, you kind of want to speak up and say something. I, I think there's some education. Fortunately, we got good guys like Dr. Yellow running around the country uh, teaching us, um, you know, I would say it'd be more like 90% or 95, but I mean, that, that gray area of, uh, of I'm not saying there's 10% of the people that can recreate that video, but I, I just wanted to make the point, I think we do have room for improvement. Mm -hmm. And that worries, I mean, that worries me. I mean, this little incidence is that uh, somebody doesn't know what they're doing and they're, you know, they're getting gas at the gas station and here's the news reporter, they whip out a prod and go to prod and a cow or something. I mean, just something stupid. Do the economics of the business these days cause not maybe you so much concern, but just a general anxiety that people are having to do things that they might not have other done, uh, been willing to do in the in, in previous, you know, occasionally tough times create incentives for behavior that you wish didn't exist in the world, you know? The bottom line mentality of some of this? It's, the economics are pretty good right now. Yeah. And, and I think there's more, which is good, I mean, I think there's more interest. And right. all of a sudden, in the weight, they're running the weight off, you know, it means a lot right now. I mean, if yeah. you, it's, it's, so there is some interesting. Ms. Douglas and then Mr. Brown. Yes. Okay. One of the requirements of our program is training. There has to be a training record. No one to, to go near an animal unless they've been trained. Now, even if it's for the owner of the farm, because there's a lot of small farms. Right. Because a lot of what we've seen is what you just described, that people are thrown in with the animals who have never touched one, seen one, know anything about their behavior or their needs. And that's a key component of, of our program is making sure that that's key, that everyone has to be trained before they even go near an animal. So that's, I just wanted Mr. to Mr. Brown, that. from your perspective as a rancher, what, what about this subject keeps you up? What anxieties do you have? I think Ms. Douglas makes a great point here in that training and making sure that people understand the job description yeah. and understand the passion that we that, that grew up in the country raising livestock have and even Adele, who didn't grow up in that environment, the passion and the, the, the compassion and passion that she has right. for the well-being of animals, I think it's a very common thing. The difference I see is that there are fewer and fewer people growing up in production agriculture with that first-hand experience of getting their boots dirty right. and understanding the, uh, uh, how animals think, how they react, how they respond and how we as humans need to do our part to understand their behavior so that we can make the right thing easy. So this is a little bit more like Dr. Gill's case where you have people coming in later who don't really have a background in this. And they're Absolutely. And having to play catch up. A lot of those, and even students that are majoring in, in agriculture, uh, right. animal science and different things. We have an internship program where we bring in right. interns every year from a variety of different states and foreign countries, and it's amazing the, the, you know, when, as we go through training with those from the first day they get there through the process, how they grow and their eyes just are open with, wow, I never dreamed it was like this. I never dreamed that, you know, how I respond to the livestock, what a difference it makes yeah. in a very positive way or a very negative way if it's done in the wrong manner. Now, how big is your operation? Our, we run right now, my wife and I have about 250 cows. Okay. And Ms. Ross? Um, in my place, I just have about 100 right now. I used to, before the drought, had about uh, 300 that we ran all the time, stalker. Right. I mean, finishing on grass. Yeah. Out in Sonora, you know, that he used to run 400 head of mama cows, and now we're down to 125. Yeah. Right. So. We'll come back to the drought. I'm, I'm yeah, just going to talk about how the water drought is my sold. big problem. Uh, Mr. Peeler, how big is your operation? The feed yard itself uh, usually has 10 to 15,000, and, and then we've got about 700 cows. And, Four or five thousand pound grass grazing, okay. just yearlings. Mr. Lemke, yeah. we run a few hundred cows, and then we carry on stalker finisher phase. Then we also run about five hundred sheep and five hundred goats to help complement that, and a few chickens and pigs. To okay. what to, to what degree? Let me ask the four of you, and certainly Dr. Gill and uh, and Ms. Douglas come into this part as well. To what degree is size dispositive in this conversation? That is to say, are smaller operations likelier to deal with? And I think Ms. Ross, you kind of alluded to this. Are smaller operations likelier to deal with these issues differently than big operations? Is big necessarily bad? We hear all the time about big, and big is scary, and you know, institutional issues come up, and it's less personal, you know, there's less of a human touch involved. 
is size, does size matter in the end in this sort of stuff? Big, and, big versus small, Ms. Ross. Sure, uh, and also not just size, but where it is. Out in rangeland, uh, West Texas, you've got all these rocks and all these stumps and you just can't run over it or, or yep. run the cattle down a lane. You can't build a lane from um, the next 20 acres so I can just open the gate and let my cattle wander down the lane right. into another pasture all kinds of things. And they have uh, larger ranches really have a problem with water <laughs> in yep. Texas. And right. that's going to be, I mean, that's going to be the name of the game, I think, is, is how we're going to take care of the water. And um, uh, I do have some views on that. But <laughs> well, we'll come back around to that, yeah. I promise. Mr. Peeler, big versus small. What no, I, I, I'm going to argue respectively. Um, and I, I deal with a lot of, we also, the, the, your, we finish cattle, we graze cattle, we do a lot of things, but, but I sell a lot of cattle to the bigger the JBSs and the Argyle, yeah. and, and I, I, I see they, their, their employees are extremely well trained. I mean, they've got policies, they've got manuals, they've got compliance yep. officers, they, and, and the little guys that are bringing us in, now these aren't your typical little guys, these guys I know they do a really good job. And, and I know there's a lot of small ranchers, and a lot of them are part-time guys, and they care about their animals a lot, and they do a great job. But, I mean, if you're just looking at numbers of operations that, that I see problems at, I mean, it's, it's a guy, it's a little guy who doesn't know what he's doing, doesn't Tend have to be patience, small. you know, drank too much of that 12-pack of beer before he went out and worked his cattle, <laughs> that type of thing. I mean, I, I don't necessarily see big is worse. Now, I mean, I've seen some bad stuff in big, a big place, too, but, I mean, I, I don't see it as big is worse and, and small is better in the form of, of humane treatment of animals. We'll let Ms. Douglas jump in and then we'll come back to okay, Mr. Brown. I, I, want, I want to agree with all of you because it all comes down to management and capacity. Yeah. Right, the there's capacity good big and there's bad big and, and totally agree. Right, That's exactly, right. because yeah. we have yeah. a JBS operation on our uh, program and they're outstanding. We have great small farms, we have great medium <clears> farms. It depends, as you said, on the land, what the capacity is on that land for how many cattle they can have. Uh, sometimes bigger operations are very efficient, they're well trained. It just, it, it, again, this is an area where it's, it, it's the whole, it's the total. You know, are there the right number of animals in that? Is there enough land for that number of animals? Is there enough water, fresh yep. water, clean fresh water? What is the management? You know, are they actually managing? Are they trained? Do they know what they're doing? It's, 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 not a, it's not a yes or no. It's not big as bad, small as good. It all comes down to how they're managed. Right. Now, I see a lot of nodding here, but I want to ask Mr. Brown, are you on Team Ross or Team Peeler as far as big versus small? I think small? they're on the same team. Well, I think they are, but I, but I hear Ms. Ross saying that, you know, in, in your case, you think small does, it, there is a, a fundamental difference, right? Well, I think you can do more yourself on small right. places. Even though there may be risks. Right, your Mr. infrastructure Mr. doesn't have to be right. as developed as these big ranches, right. but you've got to have a big infrastructure to do what you're yeah. doing. And you've got to have one for you too, even Chad, right. sort of thing. And not everybody's going to do that. It's going back to the land. Texas right. is fragmenting like mad, <laughs> and big places are just being sold off and, and divided up, parceled off and sold up. Right. Maybe Mr. Peeler, the way to ask the question is really from the perspective of the consumer. So I, as a consumer, should I care big versus small? Does it matter to me? I would say no. Yeah, I'd say no too. I, I would say no. I think it's more about the person. To me, is there a correlation, large, medium, and small, and how uh, uh, livestock uh, ranches care for their animals? I don't think there's any more correlation in that than, than a person's annual income and how they would care for a dog or a cat. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I totally think agree. it's related strictly to the person. And as we look at people coming back into the industry, similar to Mrs. Ross that had a career in another industry and then came back to the ranching business right. uh, after a very successful career, uh, outside maybe of the industry or production anyway. You yeah. see a lot of people doing that. The neat part is people like Dr. Ron Gill and our state extension service and extension services around the country are doing a great job of training beef quality assurance that I know several of you have mentioned here on the panel today, how we can best care for the animals and what's the right way to do it. Whether you have great experience growing up from the time you're old enough to walk out with the livestock yeah. or it's something that's brand new and only you experienced with your grandfather at a very young age. Let me let Dr. Gill jump in, Mr. Lemke, before I come back to you. Sir. In the discussion of big versus uh, small, I think it's easier to hold yourself accountable and manage yourself than it is to oversee a lot of people. And that's where the difference comes between large and small. Right. Well, it takes a commitment it, yeah. from management to do that. When you're the that's only right. management and labor, it's easy to do. But when you start doing that 
putting layers on there and different escape routes for, for bad management. Uh, I think it all comes down to holding ourselves accountable, monitoring what we're doing, making sure we are following guidelines, whether you're certified or not. Uh, Donald mentioned the BQA program. We have self-assessments that any producer can use to check to see where they're at relative to some standards. And I think it's important that everybody that owns livestock do that. See where you're at. Don't just assume what you're doing is okay. It goes back to what Jason was saying. There's different levels there. And a lot of people have assumed because they grew up with livestock, they know what they're doing. And not I'll assure you. Not necessarily the case. I travel all over the United States, and yeah. I know that is not true. Not, not necessarily true. That's right. Some of the That's worst right. handling is those that have been in livestock their entire life and have assumed they know what they're doing. So we have to strive to get better every day. Yeah. Mr. Lemke from, again, the, let me ask the same question I asked Mr. Brown from a consumer's perspective, does big versus small matter? Is there a cost associated with humane treatment of animals, big versus small, that we as consumers should be concerned about? I think there's a cost associated with not humanely taking care of your animals, as, as they alluded on the production end of it, yeah. regardless of where, whether you're a cow-calf operator or a, a finishing feedlot. Um, and, and the big versus small, I think, again, it's up to the consumer because there are big people doing things very well and doing things badly. There are small guys doing things well and very badly. Uh, I'm a big proponent of transparency. Um, I think consumers should ask for what they want. They should seek it out, and yeah. that's where they should purchase. There is room for the small grass-fed operator that markets 10 head a year, and there's room for the large feedlot that, or medium to large feedlot that do things right that market 20, 30,000 head a year. Would we as consumers be better off and better educated with more transparency in the way products are marketed? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, yes, I think absolutely. absolutely. It probably benefits both absolutely. the producer as well as the consumer. Yeah, yes. there's a tremendous it number of good producers. Yeah. 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 But, well, it would make everybody better okay. if we if we allowed ourselves to be viewed, mm -hmm. we would probably change some things we do sometimes. But it, but also the bad apples would rise to the top of the barrel, wouldn't they? You'd know they were bad. Yeah. But at least you could skim them off. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. Right. Yeah. But transparency, real transparency, not putting a lot of money into an ad agency to give the oh, yeah. air no, of transparency. Farm visits. I'm not talking about on-farm visits. It, just I'm talking about slogans. Yeah. You know, like what's behind the slogan? Like if you have a website, like let's have some real information mm -hmm. and statistics. But that would be consumer education, wouldn't well, it? Um, I mean, but, consumers but, with the desire to know? Well, yes. Uh, our first conflict of the morning. Well, no, no. no. <laughs> I, if I'm, that's all it is, no, we're going to have a long evening. Listen, yeah, I'll no, take no, what it, I can get. It's, it's not, I don't think it's a conflict. I'm just, no, maybe not. I think we're talking about two different things. I see companies who have spent a lot of money on PR, and sure. people think that these companies are the best and everything sure. in there is what it's actually not. Because, you know, as a consumer, you go in, you look at this label, and you think, wow, isn't this wonderful? But it's very hard when you have a busy life and you're raising a family oh, yeah. to, to read go, below the surface. Yeah. Yeah, you're talking, below you're the, talking you're the, right. the label in, I'm talking about the on-farm. Right, right, so right, it's right, the right, same right. thing, just yeah, different yeah, avenues. Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. I, heard, I heard Ms. Ross referred to by Mr. Lemke, I think, as the queen of grass -fed. Grandmother of grass I, I, I elevated you to queen. I'll say queen. Queen yeah, is my queen. Yes, yes. The first time I told her that, she frowned at me, but I think she kind of likes it now. Here's the thing, I'm a royalist. I actually would prefer that you be a queen rather than your grandmother. Can we, can we talk about this grass-fed, grain-fed, the, so the similarities and differences between production approaches and, again, what, as it relates to treatment of animals and as it relates to how consumers view what you all put out in the market? Why should we care? And I'll start with the queen. Okay, thank you. Um, I got into the real grass-fed beef business because of a grandson that was born very premature, and I'd heard Sally Fallon of Weston Price Foundation talk about grass-fed beef at one of our big meetings some, somewhere. And um, I thought, well, I could do that. I'll go try to do that. And at that time, we were feeding grain. We couldn't get weights on our cattle. Right. We couldn't get our grasses up. And so I took some off, and I uh, gave, took them off of any grain, and I sent off the meat from both sets, uh, something out of both sets of them. And they came back both just lousy. They had no CLAs to speak of, no you know, omega-3s were all shot. Um, and so I thought, oh, you know, and I could have quit right there. But yeah. I kept on because I felt so compelled to take care of my grandson and my other grandchildren that for the first time, 
Uh, see, my generation is the last one whose mothers knew every, where every bite they gave us came from. Right. So all the rest of you all have had just food fed to you. So we didn't really think about it, and that's why I raised my children too. And but my grandchildren are different. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this, I think, most of us get into grass fed. We don't want any antibiotics given. We don't want any hormones given. I don't want to feed them any grain. But also, I want all the high quality forage. Uh, and I want to build my land so that it is alive for all the food chains. I'm not just feeding those cattle. I'm feeding you know, the wasp, and I'm feeding the birds, and I'm feeding the uh, ants, and you have everybody's You a 360 happening. degree view of all this stuff. Absolutely, right? yeah. and I'm a part of that 360. I'm not sitting up at the top. Right. I am. I thought a, you were the queen. Well, <laughs> you know, queens have to go away sometimes. Yes, you know, there, there are occasionally thrones that are at ground level. Uh -huh. And we think weeds are good, but if you don't like them, there's a reason for it. Get, do something, right. take the place of them. So we started looking at this thing completely differently and started doing things differently. And uh, my brother came down and I said, well, I'm tired of doing this chemical stuff and all the weeds keep coming and we've burned everything, we've pulled everything. We've Did he need to be convinced? Well, he said, well, gosh, Betsy, what are you gonna do? Whatever you think. And I said, well, I don't know, but I'm gonna do something different. Yeah. And he said, whatever you do, don't do any organics. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I well, said, well, the, well and the, the economics of a decision like that Right. Are, and, are not inconsequential, right? Right. Yeah. And he said, you don't do it all at once. But I said, what really is organics? This was in 92. Yeah. <laughs> and it was kind of like, oh, uh, I don't right. know what organics are. So we've had to relearn what we knew when right. we were growing and, and, up and, as kids. and you feel like the decision that you made, good decision, stick with it, all that. Oh, I can tell you, health, food is so Maybe vital to our health. Right. And Mr. Mr. Peeler, you're in a slightly different place. Yeah, yeah, I, I am, and I, and I and I and I certainly appreciate the passion for the rangeland. I mean, and that's really why I got into ranching. I mean, I, right. I, and let me give you, if you don't mind, I'll Please. take up more of my share, my evolution. I, I got pegged as a feed yard guy here, and, and I and I'll happily defend that. But I mean, we ranch as well, and I mean, my interest was was grazing, and still is. I mean, I enjoy it. And, but the common misperception is, is because I finish my cattle on grain that I don't take care of my range land. But I mean, I still have cattle grazing and we still do the best job we can. And we That's minimize right. Right. You know, any sort of herbicides. We, I mean, we, 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 I study all I can study and do all I can do. And our, I think our, I, I see my pastures and I see all the neighbors and I see my dads are really good. I mean, ours are better than everybody's around us. So I, I know we're doing something right. We, we just choose to maybe run another cow as opposed to you know, a two or three year old steer that we're finishing out there. So we, we pull them off and we finish them on the feed yard, but we still manage our pastures just no different than if I, we do, actually I do grain, uh, grass finish some and it's, um, now, Ms. Now, Ms. Ross, I mean, Mr. Peeler, Ms. Ross is saying that there's a definite impact on the, uh, for health purposes, right? That, that on, on what you eat. Right, possibly. what you eat. Does that, does that cause you any anxiety at all? Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, anxiety in the form of, you know, always looking for good information. I mean, no, I, I, right. I don't know about everybody. I don't want to be producing something that's not healthy for somebody. Right. Um, but presumably, you know, and, you're not and you can you can feed antibiotics you know in pasture, right, or you yeah. can feed antibiotics in a feed yard. I mean, that's not necessarily. I mean, right. I, the first time I ever fed an antibiotic was all on pasture, and most of the antibiotics we use are cattle are on pasture that we're getting ready to go into the feed yard. Right. Uh, hormones are the same way. I mean, you, you you can you can use them on pasture, or you or you cannot in the feed yard. You can go into some sort of natural. Yeah. Uh, program. I mean, it's not a, uh, yeah. a mutually exclusive. Ms. Ross, you begrudge Mr. Peeler his decision? Do I what? You begrudge him that decision? Do you? No, no, no because you know I'm so busy, I, I can't take care of the whole world, even though I am the queen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. People, people keep saying, "Why don't you all buy more land? Why don't you do more of this and that?" We spend a lot of our time teaching other people, trying to get them right. set up with That's these right. kinds fact of things. is, you wouldn't be able to do everything you're doing on your own land if, that you have now if you went bigger. Right, right. right. But here's right. the b whole thing of it. When that little plant starts coming up in the spring, it says, Yahoo, Yahoo, who's going to bring me some calcium? I need it to break, build my nice cell wall. 
And if mycorrhizae fungi is in there, if it's alive, your underground is with all of these organisms, then it's going to say, okay, I'll trade with you. And so that little grass that comes up with calcium in it, the cows eat the grass with calcium in it, they have what they need. Then my grandkids get eat that beef and then they have what they need yeah. rather than having to supplement. That's what we're going for, right or wrong, what you yeah. do or what you don't. That's what we're doing and what we're yeah. promoting and teaching people how to do it. Dr. Gill, where do you come down along this continuum? They're both right. Yeah. Uh, there are differences between. You're in between us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You would think this was planned. Uh, wouldn't you? The, there are differences in the chemical composition of grass finished beef versus grain finished beef. When you look at it from a micronutrient standpoint, remember micronutrients, there are little, there's a little bit more omega-3s and conjugated linoleic acids and a few other components in there. There's never been any evidence that there's any real health differences between them. And I think that's, the science does not support that there are health differences. I, I, uh -uh. I, 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 I know that's not the perception and, more, and more that's not the there. sales pitch. But if you right. look at the science, there is yeah. no scientific evidence there's health differences between the two sources of beef. M Mr. Brown and then Mr. Lemke, do you all, I mean, I, I think Dr. Gill is being a diplomat here. He's sort of coming down halfway between. Do you, how, where do you all come down personally as you run your operations on this question? And how do you perceive the larger question of what's good and bad and, and indifferent? Uh, personally, I've enjoyed grass-fed beef and I've enjoyed grain-fed beef. Yeah. I uh, have no problem with either the production of or the consumption of. I think right. they're both very healthy products. Um, wow, diplomat. <laughs> diplomat, right. Yeah. As, but as we look at it, I, I think there's two sides. I think there's one, there are specialty markets. Right. And in our society today, we have a lot of choices. A lot more than we ever did. Right? Lots of choices yeah. where we can pick and choose what we want, how we want it raised, and all those things. And the fact that the average, cons the average consumer is both more aware of the choices yes. and has more places to avail himself or herself of those choices. Mm -hmm. The fact is that there are a lot more mainstream markets that carry these kind of boutique-sounding or boutique-seeming products. My parents' generation probably didn't have access to this stuff, but we all now take it for granted almost, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And but as I look at it from a global perspective, right? And I look at our growing global population, and not only the growing population, but also the aging population, the extended lifespan, right? Uh, due to medical advances and lifestyles and so right. on, you know, I, I've heard it said that you know we may need as much as twice the food supply uh, thirty years from now as we, we need today. Now, right. True. And so with that, you know, I I want to I want to be able to use all the sound science that Adele alludes to several times about how can we use the best sound science to produce the most efficient uh, animals out there yeah. so that we can more efficiently uh, provide the safest, most abundant, most affordably priced food supply in the world. And the fact is it may be in any and all, it's sort of like what we hear about, thank you, what we hear about energy, it may be in any and all strategy in the case of how we run our operations, Mr. Lemke, then come back to Ms. Douglas. It may be that we have to go both the Ms. Ross and the Mr. Peeler route. Fortunately, Dr. Gill has blessed both. <laughs> and so uh, in order for us to provide the food supply that Mr. Brown alludes to, it may require us to kind of take everything as an option available. Yeah, and, and I, I think there should be options. I think that's the great thing about where we stand in history, in this country, and in this world. We are a, a far to the, the right of grass finish. We are all grass finished. We use no hormones. Um, we use... I don't begrudge chemicals. I think they are a tool in the toolbox. We do right. dead level best never to use them on any pastures, and 95% of the time they don't. Uh, if we did have an issue that sound science determined we had to treat, then we would. But if we were to treat any of our animals, this is how our protocol is done, if we treat any of our animals with antibiotics because they get sick, that is obviously the most humane thing to do. Everyone should do that. But that animal is removed and it goes to another market and we don't sell it to our customers as obviously hormone or antibiotic free. We have some customers that don't mind that. We say this guy got uh, pneumonia at 13 months and we treated him, he recovered fine, he had three shots. There are a lot of people that don't mind that, hence uh, the feedlot in. And I, from, I don't know uh, Jason Peeler, I haven't met him before today, but I did a little bit of research on everybody in the panel and apparently what he does in the feedlot is, is the top of feedlot operations. So again, it's a consumer's choice 
full transparency. Trans and it's you about, can go trans it's about transparency. Go. Right. Ms. Douglas, and then I want to come to this antibiotics question, which has come up a couple of times, and we have a question on Twitter for, about the antibiotics question as well. Ms. Douglas, talk. Well, in terms of global, we have an, uh, a, uh, an office in Brazil. We have operations in Canada. We have farms in Canada, farms in Peru, farms in Brazil, as well yeah. as the U.S. Because it is global. You're absolutely right. And, um, and when you were talking about health benefits, um, there's also, a ta again, nothing is just black and white. There's people who do not like the taste of grass-fed, they like the taste of grain-finished. You know, and um, like you, I like, I like all of it. So, but there are people who have that, and you mentioned energy. There is a famous um, uh, producer in southern Virginia who used to drive up, he still does every two weeks. Um, it's about a four hour drive, and he would you know, bring meat and chickens for 14 families. Now, how energy efficient is that? I'm not saying he shouldn't do it, because I, you know, his stuff is wonderful. But when you're, so when you're looking at right, wrong, there's, no, nothing is right nothing or is wrong. Perfect. You know, it's like, what, right. are, what, are the, what are the parameters you're looking at? Right. So I just, I just wanted to throw those the, in. The, the antibiotic question is interesting to me because you can look at this a couple different ways. From an animal welfare standpoint, the question from Twitter I think is interesting. If I give my cows no antibiotics and they die due to infections like black leg, is that really humane? It's not humane. Treatment. No. Right. And I don't think Any disagreement does that about that up here? No. But of course, you also know that the introduction of antibiotics, to Mr. Lemke's point, into this discussion, it does change how consumers perceive. Not all consumers are going to be comfortable with that. There's also the larger question of humans developing resistance to antibiotics as opposed to, as, as a result of their use in, in some of what we're talking about. So ha where do you all come down on this? Maybe Mr. Brown first. Talk about your view of antibiotics as part of this conversation. I, I think antibiotics are a wise tool to use for yeah. the best interests of the livestock and their and, and their care. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm. Uh, what what Chad's doing with his program is, is admirable, and he's got a great market for that, and that yeah. that's super. Uh, you know, as I look at it compared to uh, our human population, with my kids, you know, they get sick. Thank goodness we have antibiotics mm -hmm. that we can use right. to care for for all species. And so I, I think it's an important part of business when used responsibly and correctly the way they're intended to be used. Right. Mr. Peeler. Mm -hmm. uh, well, another, I, I didn't finish my evolution into the feed yard, how I got into a feed oh, yard. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> no, I, I, was saying, I was just saying about that. It actually had, the good news is you always yeah. get to come back around. I do. <laughs> um, and maybe we'll talk about it later. But um, th there are a lot of myths that I learned. One is that if I bought my own feed yard, I'd know more than everybody else and like master the thing. And that, that was a myth. But also, uh, we, I use more antibiotics than the ranchers around me, but I mean, it's mostly all the calves I buy from them. I mean, I mean, they're not vaccinated properly. Anytime you get animals in confinement, it's just reality, and I'll just say it. If we all sat in this room for two weeks, and we'd all have the sniffles or something. I mean, you have to, right. and it's just, it's well, just like sending kids, kids to school without right, vaccines or yeah. something like that. I mean, it's, it's like a just, germ factory. Yeah, it's just the way it is. Yeah. But we can vaccinate, we can prevent all that. It's so the way we do our operation is, is when we're buying calves off the of ranchers, that have not vaccinated properly, then we end up doctoring a few of them. We don't use a lot by industry standards, I don't think. But in, until they're vaccinated and, 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 and really healthy, we don't bring them into a, a you know a confinement, which is still right. more room than most people think uh, to that situation. But for those, uh, for those consumers who have anxiety about it, are there alternatives though to, to antibiotics? Well, to take to, to vaccinate ahead of time is is, is a nice one, um, so we don't have to use. So many antibiotics. Yeah. I, I would. I, I mean, I, and I would also add. Um, you know, there's probably a difference, Adele. I, I, I in y'all's policy on antibiotics for growth promoting. I'll just throw this one out there versus antibiotics for treating a sick animal, which we're not going to not treat a sick animal. Period. And, and, and you know, well, that's Chad's our, not going to either. That's I mean, he's going to treat a sick Absolutely. animal. So that's I, our policy. So I, I think the consumer needs to to, to break. Maybe too much education for, for most people, more than they really care to know. But right. I mean, there is there's two there's several different uses of antibiotics, and we kind of need to figure well, out. Well, and the sub, the sub therapeutic continuous access yeah, as we, opposed to the actual treatment of yeah, a one time right, right. incident. Well, there there again that spectrum is. Significant. And I and I, and I have a little this? issue with the okay. And, I, and we, right, we sell. And my wife has a business. It's a free range chicken, and it's, it's, it's there's some grass fed beef, and and we do this when we treat one with antibiotics, we pull it out. 
So and, and, but I, I, I really, to be honest with you, I mean, that, what do you do? Feed it to the poor people. Okay, I mean, that's so my, that's what I don't necessarily I like that, 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 I mean, now Chad was saying y'all offer it to people. I sure. think that's interesting. Oh, we have people that I, 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 don't, I hear differently all the time about other people say, well, we treated this animal, you know, for pink eye. Well, we're, 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 we're throwing it out. We're sending it to the cell barn and the feed yard's going to buy it and feed it. I, I don't like that for the industry. Yeah. Um, I, I think an, antibiotic, an animal can be antibiotic free Okay, if, if he was sick or she was sick and you treated it and you gave it the proper withdrawal time or plus some and, and it's out of their system, then it was humanely handled. And you have an obligation doctor. to be transparent about that. Absolutely. Yeah, and you okay. should be under the care of a vet too. But I mean, that, yeah, absolutely. Ms. Douglas and then Dr. Okay, Douglas. so I want to agree with that because when we were writing our standards, the reason for antibiotic resistance is the subtherapeutic mm -hmm. use of antibiotics, the unnecessary continual use. Um, and we also looked at a different certification, who I won't mention, where you had to, if you treated an animal, it had to go out of the program. And we did see farmers who would wait until the animal was near death before treating it because they did not want to lose the premium on that animal. So we thought that's not good animal welfare. So we allow antibiotic use. It has to be monitored by the veterinarian. You have to have records out the wazoo because right. we're not looking for loopholes. And the uh, withdrawal time has to be observed, and they still can be under our program. And we state that in all of our standards, so we're being totally transparent. But it's not fair to then say, well, it's been treated, it's, with, it's done the, the withdrawal time, the FDA listed withdrawal time. It is no longer have antibiotics in its system. It's been treated, it's healthy. Why should it then be not stay in the program? And so that, in our standards, that's what we do, that's what we allow, and we're very transparent about very that. Do Dr. Gill, and then the queen is shaking her head back and forth to tell me that perhaps she doesn't agree. So it's we're gonna have Dr. Okay. Gill first and then. I, I think it's important to point out, and Adele alluded to this, all beef that's sold is free of antibiotics. It doesn't matter if they're treated, it doesn't matter if they're fed. Right. The antibiotics clear the system before they can enter the food chain. And that's a huge misconception floating in the public that antibiotics are in our meat all the time that are coming out of the evil feedlots yeah, or no, factory no. farms. That is, there's nothing further from the truth. Yeah. All meat has to be free of antibiotics before it can be sold or it's an adulterated product and cannot be sold for human consumption. Yeah. Ms. Ross. However, the USDA and organizations like yours or universities like yours, the science that you use to say this has passed out of their body, that's why, why you're saying it's antibiotic free. Because based on those standards that have been set, then it should have passed on out of their body. And yet there's a, a real accumulation of antibiotics, you know, we're getting disease uh, resistance to antibiotics. Where is right. that coming from? If, if it's it were not true, your point is, if it were truly antibiotic free, then we would not be developing resistance. I don't resistance think it passes out industry. like that, as, as, as the, your science says. Well, it I, I'm, but I may not even respectfully disagree on that one. Sure, might, we do that. We you have might a lot disrespect, disagree. You, you disrespectfully disagree. Yes. Oh, good. Okay, let's go. That's for the subtherapy. It took an hour. That's great. I knew the antibiotic would be one of them, but. I just choose not to do that. I don't want my children to be exposed. But the fact is, Ms. So Ross, it's a, it's a choice. It's a choice. You and, bet it's a choice. It, 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 if it were truly an adulterated product, if it was treated with antibiotics, Chad would euthanize anything that he decided to treat. Yeah, he that's right. Partition. Partition. Otherwise, that's exactly right. But by sending it, a treated animal into the regular food chain, quote unquote, regular food chain, right. and everybody in the grass-finished organic business, if they treat one of them, they don't euthanize them. No. They, no, they accept right. the fact they're all right and they put them in a different channel. To me, that's hypocrisy. L let, me, let me ask Mr. Brown and then I would I say, let me encourage, people have been kind enough to write questions on cards and pass them up to us, which is great. It's working out well. They happen to be good questions at the time that we're having the conversation. But if you want to get up at the mics in the balance of our time, we're happy to bring you in the conversation. Uh, Mr. Brown, someone wrote a really good question. I think it maybe keys off of something Mr. Peeler said. Um, I'm always, this is the question. I'm always interested in consumers on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. Yeah. We have a lot of these consumers right here in Texas. Is the focus on natural, organic, grass-fed, specialty type production ultimately detrimental to consumers least mm -hmm. able to pay for the upcharge for specialty promotion? I did, well, what I heard I'd, Mr. I'd love to answer that question. Well, and I'll come right to you next. What I heard Mr. Peeler say was, well, maybe in some cases if we have uh, uh, 
antibiotics introduced into the conversation, we say, well, we're just going to put those over here, and we're going to just dump those onto a lower end of the... So it's, I mean, I, I'm wondering if you feel like there's some either a conscious choice or an inevitable outcome here where this questioner's point about the differences between the haves and the have-nots comes into play. I think the regulations that we have in our food supply in the United States are top of the line globally. Yeah. And I think the food that we that are that is produced and distributed and marketed throughout the United States uh, is is wholesome, nutritious, and healthy. Yeah. Uh, with that, there are a multitude of different production methods, some more expensive than others. Right. And 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 some more economical. And, and inevitably, those expenses are going to be pa at the higher end. They're going to be passed on to the consumer. Absolutely. That's that's how it's it goes. a commodity business. Uh, Mr. Mr. Peeler very much wanted to get into this. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, you, um, it, it's great to have choices. Okay. And, and if yeah. Chad's going to produce, you know, a really good product that he's very proud of and wants to market it and get a premium for it, I'm a hundred percent for it. Okay. Right. There is a consumer out there. They will pay for it as long as the market bears the cost. Sure, right. But there's somebody out but, there. Who will but, pay. but there, are, I mean, there are, but there are a lot. Of, if you just go down the street of Austin or San Antonio, where I live, and I mean, you walk down the street and you see the first 500 people, you see most of them. Most of them, we have I mean, all kind of data to support this. They're concerned about food safety and price. Right. Their price. There, there is one retailer that's dominant in this area, and I know for a fact most of their stores, and their meat, and most of their stores. I talk to their meat market managers all the time, and, and a lot of their customers, especially San Antonio South, have sixty dollars a week. For grocery bills, right. so and and as an ag producer, I mean, I have I feel an obligation to, to take you know natural resources. I mean, the cattle that we have, the land that we have, right. the, the byproducts that you know that we may feed, and um, and produce a high quality protein and be able to get it in their pocket where they, where they can afford and it. So, and so tough. they really can't afford to be having so this whole conversation. You have for, for them, the option is not really there. To it's pay not, them. and we have That's to use true. science, and we have to use you know. I know people don't want to eat technology, but I mean, you've got to use some advances. Uh, in order to get it to where these people can afford it. And, and, I, and I'm off for producing a higher, I mean, some people drive Mercedes and some drive, right. you know, There's got to be a, a used Chevrolet. Some people are going to drive Kias. That's how it's going to go. Gonna I don't Mercedes. think that has an animal welfare, by the way. I, I mean, I don't, I don't see yeah. the correlation. But I, I, I think you that. can produce them economically. Miss Douglas, I think, unlike Dr. Gillis, respectfully disagree. So go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm very respectfully disagree because we have done a survey, a website survey for those who purchase products that are certified humane since 2004 through 2012. I have it tabulated 13 and 14. And it's between 1,100 and 1,600 people, and these are people who actually buy products that are certified humane. Yeah. And the majority of people, and the scale is zero uh, to 25, I mean, it goes up to 150,000. The majority of people are 50,000 to 75,000 and below. You, it's the 50,000 and below where the majority, I would say, 65% of the people who buy the products are. So you're not, because everybody says, oh, this is just for rich people. No, it's not. People, I don't care what economic level. I was a, I'm 67. I was a young mother once with three little kids, and we lived on one income, and we didn't have much. Poor people want to feed their children high quality Hel food. Healthy too. and high quality. So yes. the, the mainstreaming of this stuff is now. And we away. have, and our products are in at least 14,000 mainstream supermarkets across the U.S. It's not in like boutique stores. Well, the fact is also, Ms. Ross, that here, I mean, I didn't know which store. I was trying to figure out which store Mr. But Peeler was alluding to. Yeah. But the higher end supermarkets here have proliferated like mushrooms after a rainstorm, right? So we have many more places it's where these kinds of food is, is sort of right there in front of us. And the fact is, the greater availability means that the market may be greater. I think you don't have, to, it's wrong to make the assumption if something's produced more economical and something's produced more expensive, that somehow no, this is higher, you know, the, the more expensive is higher quality. I mean, if you're right. talking food yeah, safety and healthy for a person, I mean, it's not necessarily the same. No, it as the story that goes along with it. I or, think that's you know, the, the danger that's, taste that that's occurred here is we've started creating different classes of food. Yeah higher end food or higher quality food versus lower quality food. There is very little difference in Between the quality the yeah. of the high end product and the low end. The biggest difference is in cost of production, which runs the cost of the product up. Right. Which is not a bad thing. You've got to cover your cost. Ms. Ross and then the question right here. Okay. I have customers that come drive school buses that are all kind of, uh, you know, the spectrum of, of financial uh, uh, ability. And they tell me that one pound of my meat costs $7, ground beef, 
will satisfy, they can feed their family of four, will satisfy that family. They know where it's coming from, they know what's been happening to it. And it, the comparable is three pounds of the own special ground meat, Correct. which you fry, so and it has so much fat exactly. in it, I call so, it goofy so fat, that it goes She's away. Right. Now, that is a quality issue, yes, that's and right. that is no matter, you can, it, I feel good about offering that, and then, I don't tell them that, eat my meat, your meat will not fry away as fast. Right. And you say that there is no difference, but have you really checked all of those things, and when you come, I'd like to see y'all do some experimenting where you actually take good grass-fed beef on grass-fed land where it's not just a beginner or some of your experimental stuff that you've been fertilizing for years with the chemicals and compare some of these things. That'd be good. Well, they've done that. Well, um, no, Dr. Smith no. and all that group did not uh, do that. All right, but see, in I'm Auburn, it's got a tremendous grass-fed program. That's true. Uh, we have professors. You said at Auburn. At Auburn, yeah. And we have professors from Auburn that, are, that are bring that research that over here shows the difference in them. I've been all over the. They've been States doing just Tifton. That's what they do off over there. It's not typical grass-fed beef. Now, I, the chemical profile of beef does change with forage. Right. There's no doubt about that. With what? With, with forage. forage. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And, and so the there are density of there are all differences classes. in chemical composition, but mm. they're never. Major. I'm not saying that small difference cannot right. benefit someone. Good. Right. But it, it's not the major health differences that some people would lead you to believe it's going. To Mr. Be. Brown, and then and then right here. Yeah. Very good. I, I one th one key point I want to make here is we've gotten into this discussion. We've gotten to talk a little bit about grass-fed versus grain-fed. Loves yeah, what Adele's well talking right, about right. is Correct. is animal care and right, well-being. Right. That's, right. That's, right. That's and, right. And I think animal care and well-being directly correlates to more efficient production, regardless of the produ Ex production method. Absolutely, that you use. exactly. Right. exactly. So you, can, that, you, you, you can have uh, index high on the animal welfare scale in either case. That's, that's right. And, and I don't think right. we want to get into that kind of warfare uh, mm -hmm. on the panel that we're on today. Not that we are, but but it's animal welfare elevates both types of productions, all types of productions, to the next level. So right. regardless of whether grass-fed and feedlot is here or grass-fed and feedlot is here, everything goes up with proper animal Amen. welfare. And that's the core. It needs to be the core of any operation in any production. I like how you took control of the panel, but right back to the <laughs> good. I felt like I was talking to too much. I wanted to tell Adele. I, was, I mean, you were disagreeing, but I, I wasn't. I mean, I, no, I agree. Not with at all. You. That, that's the point. Yeah, I mean, and I don't think I mean, any don't of think us are really welfare disagreeing. No, I don't think any Harmony is good, actually. I don't think any of us Sir, are disagreeing. Actually. I'm glad you brought up production efficiency. Uh, it was mentioned that in the coming years, we're going to have to be able to feed more with less. Right. So, from the grass fed point of view and the non antibiotic point of view, how can we continue to stay on the cutting edge of agricultural technology and be progressive agriculturists? and continue to feed the world's growing population while staying at that grass-fed beef level or the anti-antibiotic level? How can we continue to produce the demand? Your, your, your that sense is demand? that the grass-fed and the and, 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 that's inefficient, is your sense? Not necessarily. Uh, what I'm asking is, is it a sustainable commodity? Is, is it something that we can continue to feed the world's population with for years let me ask. Let me ask Ms. Ross, does it scale? To the point that no. the questioner is... Well, I think right now we have so much waste in our food system, we could feed the world now. It's a matter of, of capital, of, of distribution, distribution and finances, where right. who gets to eat she's what right now. Right. Just, that's a done deal. And if, right. if you have to eat less of my meat, a third less of my meat than you would of, of, of say, feedlot meat, if that were true, then you would, we can feed the world. But regardless, and it's, it's, it doesn't mean that these guys have to quit what they're doing. It just means we have to learn to do it a different way and, and to do things differently. And yeah. we have to learn from each other. That's all I'm saying. But yes, we can feed the world. I think that is a cop out. This we've got to feed the world, so we have to quit, keep yeah. using chemicals. I think we have and forty shops. percent of the food we have is wasted or something. Yeah. I mean, oh, it is a huge amount. amount. And it's disheartening. I mean, it really. Throw when you go away. to a steakhouse and you think, why did I so work hard to produce that? Why did you leave it on your plate? It's production, but it's yeah. efficient yeah. consumption. Absolutely. And, and distribution. And efficient and and distribution. And efficient the, que the question you brought up technology, or alluded to the fact that technology is now a part of the conversation, certainly in the case of some of the folks up here who have been doing this for a long time or whose families have been doing this for a long time, there's no question that the introduction of, of technology has changed the calculation. Mr. Lemke, Mr. Brown, five generations of this, Mr. Peeler, 
how has technology changed the way you do business in the realm of the topics we're talking about? Animal welfare, efficiency of production, what have you? Uh, technology is like anything. It can be used for good purposes. It can be used for bad. I'd like to back up just a second to the efficiency sure. uh, question there. The, the way that we do it with modern day technology is to go back to the way things used to be done. Our animals have gotten too big, too inefficient, our land bases are fractured, we're not taking care of the soil profile the way that we should be taken care of. Okay. Animal needs, animals need to be much smaller, much more fat, they can, we, they've proven that you can run just as many animals, if not more, on grass as you can on grain. People are doing it all over the country. So that's not a battle that I like to, to participate in because it's been proven. And I'm also not a huge fan, with all disrespect, of exact science because we can take any exact science methodology and interpret it the way we want to. So we have to be very careful saying that exact science says this and exact science says that. Because I agree with Betsy Ross, there is nutrient density in foods that has to be entered into the equation. Mr. Brown, what about technology? How has technology changed your operation at Throckmorton? Technology over the last century in Throckmorton has changed our business significantly and made us, uh, we're in the bull business. Right. We sell, we raise and sell breeding bulls to go to, in fact, several of these guys here on the panel have used our mm -hmm. genetics and our goal is to produce, here's our mission. Okay, let me just share our mission. It's very sure. simple. Our mission is very simple that we are continually striving to improve the efficiency of converting God's forage into safe, nutritious, and great tasting beef to better feed his people. And that's why our family's in the cattle business. Yeah. And that's why so many of our customers and people in the livestock industry are, are in, their, in our business. But I don't hear, Mr. Brown, in that mission, any mention of doing it without use of modern conveniences or conveyances. That's right. right. That's right. I want to I want to use all the tools available to me yeah. that where I can be more efficient and still provide the care and the concern for the well-being of the animals as possible. Right. I would say the technology that we use has changed as much as this little machine has changed our lives. Right. Well, that, that but see, the problem is that one's now outdated as of last Point. week. Good point. <laughs> right. You know, the problem with new technology is it's like driving a car off the lot. The value of it plummets immediately the way that you do it. Mr. Peeler, technology. Yeah. How, okay, what's your specific question? Well, my specific technology? question is, has technology it's changed the way you do business to increase your efficiency of production or to make it possible it's, for you to deal with some of the issues we've talked about here today? Yeah, technology's changed. Um, you know, the, uh, we hire, uh, like in the feed yard, we have a professional nutritionist and we have a vet. Both. Yep. And, and just strictly in the way what he knows, the nutritionist knows about rations and, and studies that have been done. I mean, we, we can work in, you know, byproducts like out of I mean, distiller's grains, yes. bakery products, yes. and, and things that there's more to the feedlot deal than just, I, I, I want to separate it from range management because I, I do them both and I see them differently. Um, I mean, there's a lot of information. I don't know if technology is the right word for it. I mean, uh, when people were feeding, uh, you know, whole cotton seed back in the 1800s, next that's where feed yard, like some of the feed yards started. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's technology that's been there. I'm, I'm, I'm scrambling. Uh, if you want to talk about some of the science I think is out there, what I've seen uh, universities do uh, uh, in the way of like new medicines or, or yeah. you know, and, you, and I hate to bring this word up, but the hormones, I mean, have, I mean they, that's 15% increase in efficiency, um, yeah. you know, whether you like them or not. I mean, that's technology. Um, Trucking has gotten better. So the modern um, world has really computers have helped us out. Right. Yeah, all computers aspects. Question right there, sir. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask a question to all of y'all. I, I farm and ranch, also own a trucking company, and um, I see a lot of facilities that uh, you know are held together by brush and <laughs> and uh, baling wire and and things like that. Um, big facilities like uh, your feedlot. Uh, the asset of good facilities and good pens and good flow for cattle going back to the animal welfare yeah and also um, the employees uh, a lot of times when we see these videos they are you know hourly employees who don't have an agriculture background they're right. just hired into this the gets industry. back to the training question that we back to the training about, yeah. and uh, you know we we touched on the employees but the, the asset of good facilities I'll leave that to y'all that's a jump ball. Dr. I'll, Gil. I'll, I'll kick off. The yeah. facilities are a major hurdle sometimes to proper handling of livestock. I'm not going to say that proper handling of livestock is dictated by the 
quality of the facility. That would be a cop out. Uh, in fact, the best cattle handlers you'll ever find are working pink, uh, cattle in a set of bed springs, yeah. pens held up by trees and whatever, because you know you can't mishandle them or they'll break out. Right. And so I think we can use that as a cop out for not doing some things. But I do think design a facility, training of employees can make that a much less stressful uh, process. Yep. And that goes back to what uh, Jason was talking about on the cattle he received. Sometimes most of the stressors that cause an animal to get sick are man, man created, yeah, human right. created. So if we don't figure out a way to better handle that, right. then we have to use more antibiotics to treat. We have to do some more things to, to compensate sometimes for mismanagement. I'm, I'm intrigued by this question of workforce as well. I think the facilities question is great, but let me say you've got a, a Floresville, a, a Granger, Throckmorton, Mason up here. We as a state are changing uh, by the day. Population of the state is growing, but we're becoming a more urban state less of a rural state, many of the areas of the state where the population is growing are the more heavily populated uh, uh, parts of the state, and the rural areas are declining in population. Do, do you find in some of the areas where you all do business that it's harder to find people to work your operation simply because the population is just dwindling? Is that an issue? Workforce well, development? I, I think so. I, yeah. I think farming and ranching is hard work. And, and there's no 40-hour work weeks. And Americans, we really like our 40-hour work yeah. weeks. We like our vacations. We joke and we say no good vacation goes unpunished because if you're gone two or three days, <laughs> That's I'm, it. I'm fearful to turn my phone back on at 12.01 <laughs> yeah, yeah, because there's no telling what has occurred. But, but it's, it's a lifestyle, and it is a difficult lifestyle. So it does take a certain kind of person. And I think that one of the mistakes we make have made over the years in our operation is we'll bring somebody new in and just throw them out there, kind of assuming that they know what's going on because we have 30 other things to go to, to, to take care of can't that. Do that. And so when things go wrong, we can only blame ourselves. We can't blame them because we didn't give them training. And that's where the training is so important. It doesn't, only apply, to, the hard it doesn't only apply to your business. That's it right. also applies to that's my right. business. Well, I, can... I want to make a suggestion. Yes. I have a friend whose son was very interested, in, no agriculture background, but really interested in farming and learning. And he got a job in, somewhere here in Texas um, and came out. I mean, it started as an intern and he wound up with a paid job. And I'm sure even though things are urban and you have big cities in Texas, I would guarantee you there are a lot of young folk who would be very oh, interested yeah. in coming right. and you working you on your it. farms. And um, it, it might be something to think about. It might be oh, something yeah. to no, think that's, about. No, that's very common. Many, many producers use that method. Ma'am. So we've gotten this far in the conversation. We still haven't talked about water. Well, I, I, meat, I, I, meat I production. Promise. Well, I know. Well, we need to get. I'm get, keeping you on task because I want to talk about it because it's meat right is there. notoriously inefficient in its use of water. You know, right. if we're talking about you know, well, the ag gallon, industry certainly use, is, a, is a heavy user. Of well, water. and you know, if you're going to look at a plate of food and calculate how many gallons of water right. it took to produce it, a meat-filled plate is going to have infinite times more. And as right. we right. find ourselves in Texas, so we can, can we can consider that an arguable point, by the way. And I'd like it. I would I would love to hear arguable whether the ag industry is a heavy user of water. Well, what oh, better no, use no, of no, water I know the ag industry, well, but well, I know what a head of lettuce is. Well, I'm saying right? heavy. Yeah. I'm only going I'm as saying, far as heavy. I'm saying heavy, but I'm saying you know if we throw out you know half a pound you know half a pound of, of ground beef. So what is so Chad's? operation? I mean, it's native range land, irrigated land? We have a little bit of irrigated yeah. land, but we use, um, we may use 500 to 750,000 pounds of animal per acre per day. Sometimes we may move three or four days. And what we're doing is we're taking all that manure and feces, bad words, and, and throwing it down, which is actually fertilizer. And so what we do is we create a cover on that ground. And studies show, again, partial exact science, but studies indicate, studies show that the, the, the longer time of duration that you do that for the land, the more spongy that material becomes. And we go from a 10 or 15 percent utilization of a rain to an 80 or 90 yeah. percent. That's so why that I asked you that question. captured, converted to forage, yeah. and goes down we, in the aquifer. So recharge. when I take my compost, I mean, I've seen calculations for water and beef. Compost pieces, is phenomenal. And it's, and it's totally off. And, I mean, and I'm surprised. I mean, as an industry, we sit around with each other and think, where in the world did they get these numbers? Yeah. Uh, but we don't. We haven't really made a good point. But I mean, I, I mean, it take. I mean, I can increase the water holding capacity of, of soil enormously, and, and, and you know, it, it depends on whether you're using irrigated crops or non-irrigated crops. I mean, part of uh, part of the the the, uh, the amazing thing about a ruminant animal, um, or really maybe all all animals, is that we can use stored forage. I mean, you can make feed when it's raining. That's right. Sure. And, uh, and and store it and feed it back. I mean, I, the, the water consumption data that I see, I mean, just assumes all corn. First of all, it seems like a 100% corn diet 
from the day they're born. And by the way, calves are not born in a feed yard. I mean, that's another that's misconception. Ridiculous. It's like it's born, raised, die range. in a feed yard. It's totally Sounds off. like you have a marketing yeah. challenge here. Well, no, no, we do. And that's no doubt. No doubt we do. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, cons the water consumption, when you, when you take meat on a plate versus a head of lettuce, it's 100% irrigated yeah. and, and very little dry yeah. matter in right. it at all. I mean, there's nothing to it. But, I mean, that's, that, in, in rice probably is the worst of all. Let, of let me ask Ms. Ross, because yeah. she was the one who used the D word first, I think, in this conversation. The fact is, here in Texas, we have been in north of 90% drought conditions for several years. I don't know if it was 2011 or 2012, was said to be the worst one-year drought. 2011 in the history of the state, worse than the time it never rained. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, the fact, and we are only sort of coming to gri grips with the magnitude of the problem from a public policy standpoint here in the state capitol and the amount of money that we're deploying toward trying to solve this problem, it does impact the work that you all do, Ms. Ross. Oh, Ms. boy, Ross Hobbit, does Ross, it. Yeah. And uh, really, the ability to build soil organic matter, which will hold that moisture, we need to keep our moisture on our lands, whether it's your front yard or yeah. your back trap or your bull trap or whatever. And that is a function of roots going down deeply. That is a function of, of building that organic matter, holding on, keep as much as you can, however you can, on your place. And right. Texas is drying out. And when that happens, the sun comes down and bounces back off, the heat rises, evaporation increases, and we're losing it. Plus, when it rains hard, it sheets off and goes, we lose it into the streams and all. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. And I can do that at my place, my yard. No government can tell me I can or can't make that happen. As long as I'm doing, you know, I mean, there's, what are the rules about that? We right. have a choice about that. Yeah. And to me, that is setting up a live system with all the biology back in there, all of the chemistry, all of the physical attributes. Could you do it without stuff. grazing animals? You can, I think it's harder. I think grazing very animals difficult. are very, really very important. Difficult. But if it's you bear the soil yeah. with them, if you don't know how to graze, and that's why I'm so it's glad y'all are teaching it uh, right. more now, is you, you would, I mean, you undo everything. Uh, by not letting your so we should get credit for. I mean, in my mind, we should get some credit as I mean for those who are working towards yeah. better range of land. I mean, that that should be water basically put back into that equation. And then we'd not. have a fuss over what's better range land. But yeah. if we measured it on soil organic measure too, you know, we've got to hold on to this water. We uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. It's amazing how the time well, we had a long time yeah, to talk, and the time has gone by. We haven't covered everything, and I actually have to take Mr. Lemke's. Uh, example here to heart and try to get this back to animal welfare, which after all was the overall topic of the conversation. We've kind of come back and forth on it. Um, let me ask you about practices like dehorning and castration. You know, p big city people like me who don't have any experience on, uh, in the work that you all do may look up at that, those practices and others and think, well, that's the definition of inhumane, or that's the definition of, of lack of animal welfare, you know, concern for animal welfare. But the fact is there are many things that you all experience and practice as a matter of course that probably deserve some discussion and, and help help us understand, Mr. Brown, what, you know, what, what, how, how should we all regard those practices as it relates to animal welfare? Well, a lot of, a lot of cattle were born with, with, with horns and genetically we've been able to dehorn a lot of cattle yeah. uh, with, with a pole gene that's automatically taken off uh, those horns and, and we've been able to provide the care for the animals so that predator evasion is not as much of an issue where the horns were to help protect their young and their offspring. Right. And so we've been able to handle some of that. As far as castration, I see it, you know, in a similar sense at a young age to circumcision of a child. Yeah. I don't remember it. Right. I'm sure. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, uh, Mr. 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 Brown, I'm okay. if, if, your yes. intention, if your intention was to stop the conversation dead in its tracks right there, you did it. You did it. Ma'am. Okay. We have, uh, we just, we revised our um, beef standards, beef, dairy, and uh, young dairy beef in uh, 2012, and we had uh, Dr. Hans Kotisi, who's originally from South Africa, did studies on um, a, a, a drug called meloxicam, which is like, it's not ibuprofen, it's like ibuprofen. And the studies they found was that the problem with castration was not the actual castration, it was the, the 40, 24 to 48 hours after. And that, and the other issue was, you know, most of the, if you wanted pain, uh, 
control or um, anesthesia. It had to be done by injection. And as you said, which is true, most cattle are born on the range. They're not born in feedlots. You have range conditions. You have people who may not know how to do the injections. It causes infections in the site. And so our original standards didn't require that because it was probably going to create more animal welfare uh, problems for the animals to have people who didn't know what they were doing try to be giving injections to the cattle. So this Molexicom can be given in water. And so we had, so we had, um, so, but it has to be done, prescribed by a veterinarian. And what it does is it basically is a, a painkiller for 48 hours, 24 yep. to 48 hours afterward. We had a, a workshop. We, which we paid for all of the producers who wanted to go to look at the studies to see how it was done. Um, and they had videos of how the calves eat right away, you know, and how, how they, they gain weight. And um, the only, since it's not, uh, veterinarians can write it off label, not off label, I guess off extra label, label, extra, extra label. label, thank you, my brain's not functioning, extra label, and some will and some won't. And if the veterinarian won't, well, then there's, you know, they, we, we, there's nothing we can do. I mean, they can't have it, they can't have it. But, and we have, we have DVDs of this for them to give their veterinarians. And it's interesting because once the uh, producers do this, they're quite happy with it. They're happy with the result. So um, the thing is to make the procedures as um, um, painless as possible. As yep. we, there are age ranges when it should be done, when it is as painless as possible. So there are ways. There are ways to accomplish this end. Exactly. Well, yes, and that's what I'm saying. Right. Uh, Mr. Hall is telling me that we're just about out of time. Uh, we got about three minutes. Got about three minutes. Uh, let me ask one, you know, very easy to solve, non-controversial yeah, right. question, and that is to end this, <laughs> and that is about the proper role of government in this conversation. And where, you know, again, I come back to Ms. Ross, who talked about, you know, I have freedom on my land with it relates to water, do whatever I want. Nobody can tell me what I can do. Is there a proper role for anybody at the regulatory level, state or federal, to come in and help you manage some of these issues of animal welfare? Let me clarify yeah. that. Let me... <laughs> I'm not doing it, breaking any laws. Oh no! I think no. You're bragging about your about how uh, your liberty. I don't think there's anything wrong with but that I'm at all. But I'm saying we have it. these choices we can yeah. make. But in food safety, you bet we want some regulation yeah. on this. You bet I want that processing company to have that stamp on right. there. I want it done right because it is serious right. when there's something going wrong with it. And Government involvement is not always a popular thing these I mean, days. It's so amazing I mean, it's to hear you say how important you feel yeah, like this is. That it, our food supply. Any is disagreement up here about Miss Ross's point of view on this? That <laughs> no, I, I, mean, I don't fear the black helicopter sh showing up. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think she's right. Food safety is a, a I think the mere mention of black oversight. helicopters is a tell, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I think food safety has is, is got to have some oversight. And, and I think there are probably a few environmental issues. That should, and by the way, I, I am whatever our water consumption is, yeah. I'm all for making it better. I mean, I, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't mean to brush that. No, I didn't, I didn't mean to brush that question. Yeah, off. Yeah. Mr. Lemke, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap it up. Okay. Mr. Lemke. I think we have to be careful with overregulation because it occurs on many, many levels, especially when it comes to the environmental end of things. But as far as food safety issue, yes, I know that we use these common sense and government. Those are oxymorons sometimes, but that's what it needs to be, common sense regulation. All right, we need, we need to wrap it up here. Our time is up. Uh, come on back at 1.30, please. We'll have a panel on farming methods. It is essentially the other half of the coin. Animal welfare is farming methods. Farming methods is animal welfare. You may hear some of the same topics discussed, but through a different lens. Thank you all. Let's please thank our panelists. Thank you. Good conversation. Thank you.